Hello, Institute of Catholic Culture family. I uh, wanted to send you a message today as we prepare ourselves for the great feast of the Ascension of our Lord. Instead of, of uh, sending out our normal Sunday Gospel reflection this week, we're sending you a, a gift. Uh, well, a special gift, I guess. I hope you enjoy it. It's a little recording. A one-hour study of the Feast of the Ascension that I did some years ago, a few years back. But I, I really gained a lot in preparation for that uh, study, and I hope you'll be able to profit from it also. Some insights from the Church Fathers, going through the biblical text and so forth. So uh, you'll be receiving this, this message. Uh, some, some of our dioceses celebrate the Feast of the Ascension on, of course, Ascension Thursday. Some postpone it, the celebration to Sunday. So we are giving you this study. I hope that it will uh, be a benefit to you as we prepare for Ascension Thursday, but also in preparation for this coming Sunday. May God bless you as we celebrate this beautiful feast of the Ascension of our Lord. I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. The words of Jesus Christ in his high priestly prayer in the Gospel of John. We'll come back to that toward the end of the talk. Our goal this evening is to understand the mystery of the Ascension as those who saw it would have. To understand it according to the vision of those who wrote about it. To understand it according to the understanding of the early Christians. And there, with a firm foundation in the sacred scriptures, understanding what the evangelists wanted us to understand from these texts, I do believe we'll be better able to celebrate the Feast of the Ascension and ultimately to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, which is coming in a few days. I want to begin by giving you a little bit of a structure to hold on to of interpretation of your Bible. I know oftentimes you open your Bible and say, how am I supposed to understand these difficult words? And sometimes they are difficult, but you have to have certain tools in your tool belt so as to kind of dive into a text which you're not used to reading. We're not used to reading stuff that was written 2,000 and even three and four and 5,000 years ago in the Old Testament. Okay? And so we have to have certain principles at the forefront of our mind. And the first, the first principles I need to give you are some, just some basic things about when you're reading your Bible, how you're to read the text. Okay, the church gives us certain rules by which we can kind of get into the text, and that is first and foremost, always your scriptural text you have before you has a literal understanding, or I should say a literal, maybe ba better said, literal historical meaning to it. The meaning that the author tried to give to you, and if you're taking notes, write that down. The literal historical level, every other interpretation of scripture has to be rooted in that. What did the author mean by writing these words down for us? And once we've ascertained that meaning, what is going on in the historical text as we're going to see with the Ascension tonight, then there is further meaning which we can draw forth from that scriptural text. It's called the spiritual interpretation. And please, when I say spiritual interpretation, I don't mean not real. Okay? I know today for us, we oftentimes hear spiritual as kind of like Disneyland, right? <laughs> not at all. In fact, the spiritual life is real life. It's the ultimate life into which we're called. It's the ultimate reason for the historical text. It's the reason for the incarnation. Okay? Yes, Jesus was born. This is the historical reality that God became man, that God rose from the dead. This is a historical fact. But there's a further meaning of why he rose from the dead what he did with our human nature. And that is the spiritual interpretation. The Catechism says that thanks to the unity of God's plan, the, that, that events are signs of a deeper significance. And within this spiritual interpretation, the church divides out also further interpretations which can be given to the scriptures. And the first one is the, within the spiritual is the allegorical or typological sense of the scriptures. What is that? The kind of difficult words. What do those mean? 
the allegorical or typological sense, if I can even put it into my own words, is that the historical event is a sign, as I said earlier, of the spiritual, of that further meaning, so that things which happen can be signs of something more, even more historical realities which are going to be revealed later on. The crossing of the Red Sea is a type of baptism. It's a prefigurement and a preparation for baptism. So when we're reading through the Old Testament, we read the crossing of the Red Sea, we see through the waters of the Red Sea the mystery of our own baptism, and we better understand our own baptism by reading the story of the Red Sea. Okay. The moral sense that from these stories in Scripture we learn how to act properly. And the eschatological sense uh, eschatological sense, the sense which, by which we see in the historical events something which points to the heavenly kingdom, that God is preparing us even now for what we will enjoy for all eternity. And oftentimes the historical and eschatological touch upon each other very closely as we see today with the ascension of the Lord. Yes, it is a historical event that Christ ascended into heaven. And it points to the reality that our human nature is enthroned in the, in the throne of God himself. And from there, Christ reigns in his human nature. We'll talk more about that. Remember that that spiritual interpretation is always rooted in the historical narrative. It keeps the interpretation rooted and for us going far off in wild directions in our interpretation. Okay? So our first thing that we want to do tonight is look at the historical text. So open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 16. Okay? Mark chapter 16. That's in your New Testament, Catholics. Mark chapter 16. During question and answer, we'll talk about why I'm skipping Matthew. Uh, Mr. Dubois is going to ask a question about that later. Okay. Chapter 16, verse 19. Mark gives just a few verses about the ascension. Chapter 16, verse 19. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the, sight, by the signs that attended it. Notice in Mark the connection between Christ's ascension and the mission of the apostles. We're going to talk a lot more about that. Okay, that's Mark. Let's turn to Luke chapter 24. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 24. 24 verse 50. Also in, in Luke, the text is quite short. Okay? Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. I have a little map here for you because, of course, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's going off the side of the page, but it's okay. I'll tell you what's there. Um, the, uh, where is Bethany is a fundamental question if you're going to be reading your Bible. How many Catholics know where Bethany is? Okay, a few of you have been to the Holy Land before. Bethany is just off the edge. I'm sorry, but it's like, it's like right here, okay? It's like right over here. On the other side of the Mount of Olives, it's a close walk down the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane and to the Kidron Valley. Okay? It's not far to go. In fact, Bethany can really be considered this whole area on top of the Mount of Olives. Not necessarily the city proper, but the region, the area. And the place of the ascension that Luke d tells us about is actually known today. You can go there, and it's just on this side of the Mount of Olives. You can go there. Okay? In fact, here we have Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, which of course has the Dome of the, the Rock on it now. But this surface, oh, oopsie, 
The, the, uh, the surface area is the area where the original Temple Mount would have been and of course drops into the Kidron Valley and then goes up onto the Mount of Olives and to the area that we're talking about in Bethany. Okay. We skip John because John does not tell us about the ascension proper. In the sense he doesn't give us the historical the text. So we're going to skip now to Acts of the Apostles. Okay. Acts of the Apostles, of course, is written by... Luke, the evangelist. So now we have Luke telling us two stories. Okay? Acts chapter 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commandment through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his passion by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days, and speaking of the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. And John baptized with water, but before many days you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Notice, they're asking about the kingdom of God. Is it now? And he says, you will not know, it's not for you to know, but you will receive that power, that gift that you're looking for when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So when is the kingdom of God going to be restored? When the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And they will know then the answer to their question. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Remember that. As they're looking up, a cloud comes in. He ascends upon the cloud and departs, riding on the clouds of heaven. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went. Behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who, is, who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. Do you notice? Luke earlier told us that they went where? Yeah. Bethany. And now he says they went to? The Mount of Olives, okay? And that is that area right up there. In fact, this is the Russian Orthodox Church of the Ascension. And all of the claimants for the location are right there within like, you know, a half, a quarter mile, not even a quarter mile of each other, okay? All right, there's another view of it also. Okay, and this is the traditional site of the Ascension of the Lord. You can see off even into the Jordan Valley, Okay, through down the Kidron and out into the Jordan Valley there. It's a beautiful view. Okay. All right. I told you that the historical context is fundamentally important. We've looked now at the biblical text. We've also looked at a little bit of the geography. Uh, we need to look at one other aspect, and that is the Jewish calendar that was being celebrated at the time. It is fundamentally important when studying the life of the Lord to understand what He was doing. Just like it was important for anyone that knows anything about you to know that you've been celebrating the Feast of the Ascension. Hopefully since Thursday when Christ ascended into heaven. We'll leave that for another discussion. <laughs> So this third historical context which I want you to grab onto is the reality of the liturgical life of the Jews. Of course, P Passover took place in the context of Christ's passion, okay, on the 14th of Nisan. And you can write down in your notes if you want Leviticus chapter 23 and Exodus chapter 12. We don't need to turn there right now. I am going to have you turn to Leviticus in just a second, though, because a few days after Passover, 
and in fact in the context of Passover, was the beginning of another festal cycle. In fact, it was a festal cycle which was rooted in Passover itself. Okay? And it was the counting of the Omer. It began, it was the harvest season. When does Passover take place? What season of the year? Spring, exactly. And you know in the spring, the barley starts to grow and the wheat starts to grow and very quickly it grows fast. Very quickly it can be cut down and harvested. This whole season from Passover to Pentecost is a time of thanksgiving. A time when the Jews took the gift of the harvest which they had received and offered it to God. And in fact, in fact, three days after the Passover... On the day of the resurrection of the Lord, on that first Sunday, Easter, Pascha morning, was the feast of the offering of the first harvest of barley. It was called the feast of the first fruits. What did they do? I'll read you a a short quotation. On Passover, a marked sheaf of grain was bundled and left standing in the field. In other words, as our Lord was arrested and tied up, they went out across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives and bound the first offering, the sheaf of barley, in the context in which Christ was being taken to his cross. The sheaf was cut, I'm sorry, on the next day, the first day of unleavened bread, the sheaf was cut and prepared for the offering on the third day. On this third day, the priest waved the sheaf offering before the Lord, counting the days then begins and continues until the day after the seventh Sabbath, the 50th day, which is called Pentecost. So Passover is then connected to Pentecost through the harvest, the harvesting of the barley and the offering of this harvest of the first fruits to the Lord. It was literally called the feast of the first fruits. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians just after Romans. So Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. You might be asking yourself, what's the big deal? Okay, fine, there's all these festivals going on among the Jews, but what's the big deal? First of all, Christ chose his passion for Passover, by which he would go from the life, from this world to the next life, by which he would take our humanity and bring it into the presence of God, by which he would pass over death and give life back to Adam. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verse 20. Verse 20. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Huh? St. Paul knows, because St. Paul was a Jew and he was a faithful Jew, he knows that Christ rose from the dead on the feast of the offering of the first fruits, that first barley sheaf which was cut and offered to God. St. Paul knows also that that feast was a prefigurement, a type of the one who was to come, Jesus Christ, who would be raised from the dead. Oh, I had all sorts of great slides in here. Look at that about the Mount of All, or about, about Mount Sion and the upper room. But we'll skip those for now. Okay? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. As St. Paul says, He is the first fruits. But if He is the first fruits, what else does that mean? Ah, thank you. There are other fruits which are about to be harvested. And if that first cut of barley which was brought before the Lord and offered to Him was the first fruits which pointed to Pentecost. Now, 50 days later, on the Feast of Pentecost, was the conclusion, as I said, of, the, of this feast, which began on the offering of the first fruits. And on that day, on Pentecost, the grain which was harvested during those 50 days were baked into two loaves. 
and brought into the temple and offered before God. I have this beautiful image from the catacombs of the praying woman in the Oron's position, praying, lifting her hands to God in prayer. That beautiful image of man restored like Adam before the fall. Christ himself, of course, is that first offering, that first sheaf, that first fruits offered back to God. But he himself points 50 days later to the fulfillment of what he has begun when his apostles will baptize 3,000 people in one day. When as the loaves of Pentecost are being offered in the temple, those fresh loaves which had been prepared and baked in the oven, now in the upper room, the fire of the Holy Spirit descends upon the church, baking her, if you will, so that she can be then offered, as you see in the icon, offered to God like Adam before the fall. This offering was known as a toda sacrifice, a th- literally a sacrifice of thanksgiving. In the Greek, friends, the offering of the Eucharist, literally the offering of the Eucharist, St. Paul says that offering, that Todah sacrifice known to the Jews is now fulfilled in Christ who offers himself in thanksgiving to the Father. In fact, there's an old rabbinic teaching, an intertestamental text that says, in the coming messianic age, all sacrifices will cease except the thank offering, the Todah offering, The Eucharist offering, literally, it will never cease. I want to share with you a quotation from the then Cardinal Ratzinger, and he wrote his book, Spirit of the Liturgy, which is a wonderful read. I suggest it to, uh, I suggest it highly. He says on page 27, he, he asked the question, what is worship? What is worship? Because I think it's very difficult maybe for us to understand this, under, this idea that the cutting of the sheaf, the cutting of the barley, and the offering before God can be a sacrifice. Doesn't sacrifice require death? Doesn't sacrifice require destruction? Isn't sacrifice for cutting the throat of a lamb and burning it before God? He says this, In all religions, sacrifice is at the heart of worship. But this is a concept that has been buried under the debris of endless misunderstandings. The common view is that sacrifice has something to do with destruction. It means handing over to God a reality that is in some way precious to man. Now this handing over presupposes that it is withdrawn from use by man. And that can only happen through its destruction, its definitive removal from the hands of man. But this immediately raises the question, what pleasure is God supposed to take in destruction? Is anything really surrendered to God through destruction? One answer is that destruction always conceals within itself the act of acknowledging God's sovereignty over all things. But can such a mechanical act really serve God's glory? Obviously not. True surrender to God. True sacrifice. And I want you to look at this icon and think of Christ as that first fruits, that first offering of the resurrection. True surrender to God looks very different. It consists, according to the fathers, in fidelity to biblical thought, in the union of man and creation with God. Belonging to God has nothing to do with destruction or non-being. It is rather a way of being. And here, I believe we begin to see what St. Paul is talking about. That Jesus is the new Tada sacrifice. The new Eucharistic offering. The new first fruits having risen from the dead. Man fully restored to union with God. And here, again, I believe we're placed in a broader context. 
and ultimately the most important context, we begin to get to the heart of the matter, the purpose of the incarnation, the passion, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ. The heart of the matter is, the context is, the story of creation, and ultimately the fall of Adam and Eve. Again, Cardinal Ratzinger in his book Spirit of the Liturgy says, Christian thought has taken up the scheme of going out and returning. He uses the words exitus and reditus to understand the idea of salvation and redemption and creation. It says, but in so doing, it distinguishes two movements, one from the other. The exit or the going out is the creator's free act of creation. It is his positive will that the created order should exist as something good in relationship to himself, from which a response of freedom and love can be given back to him. God's free act of creation is indeed ordered toward the return. The creature accepts creation from God as his offer of love, and thus ensues a dialogue of love. Now what is love? Love is simply put, the giving of one's life to the other. And here he says, begins a dialogue of love between God and the creature. That holy new kind of unity that love alone can create. The being of man is not absorbed or abolished, but rather is gi in giving itself, it becomes fully itself. This return to God bestows its full and final perfection. This is how Christians understand God being all in all. Listen to that. We're going to come back to it in St. Paul. This is how God understands, or how the early Christians understand God being all in all. But everything is bound up with freedom. And the creature has the freedom to turn the positive gift of God, the exitus, of its creation around, as it were, to rupture it in the fall. This is the refusal to be dependent, saying no to reditus, no to giving ourselves back to God. Love is seen as dependence, and it is rejected. This is the problem of the fall. God has given himself to us in the beginning, and rather than taking that life, and giving it as an Im being born in the image and likeness of God as Adam and Eve were, rather than doing what God has already done in giving themselves the life they have received ultimately to creation and offering that creation in return to God in sacrifice, giving himself and all that he is in contact with back to God, Adam and Eve turned that gift inward and on themselves. And this is the fundamental reason why Jesus Christ was born. Never forget that. Every theology book in the history of the world was written about this. And it is very simple. That Jesus Christ has come to take upon himself human nature. That he might receive life from his Father and give that life back in sacrifice. To give himself back to the Father, and with Him, all of creation. Because God Himself gave Himself to us in the beginning, we are then called to give our life to creation, to those whom we are in contact with. I hope that the scales begin to fall off, that Christ's passion, His resurrection, His ascension, and His giving of the Holy Spirit, His life in Pentecost, was ultimately must ultimately be understood in these terms. In terms of man's redemption, of his restoration to his original state as made in the image and likeness of God who loves us. It is God who pours himself out in love. And in making us like himself, he has called us to do the same. To pour out our life to others and ultimately to Him, raising up ourselves and those around us as a toda sacrifice, as a Eucharistic thanksgiving to Him, until He becomes all in all. 
I want to leave this foundational aspect for just a moment because we have another layer, another strata, historical reality that we have to deal with in the text. So I want to come back to the historical narrative of Acts. So turn back to me, with me there to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. This is where we're going to start to get in a little bit more of the stake of the talk tonight. So please stay with me. And when I turn, ask you to turn to the Old Testament, you're going to turn there with me, right? Even if you have a hard time finding where to go. Okay? It's okay. We're going to work on it together. All right. Acts chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 9. Verse 9. And when he had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. There is a reason why Luke the Evangelist is writing and specifically notes this aspect of the ascension, which is so fundamentally important. I want to tie it quickly to Acts chapter 7, to the defense that St. Stephen gives and the prayer that he offers as he is about to be martyred for his faith. Let's look at Acts chapter 7, verse 56. Verse 56. Let's go to verse 54. Okay, 754. Again, Stephen is about to be martyred and we hear his last witness. He says, now when they heard these things, they were enraged. The Jews were enraged and they ground their teeth against him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And notice how he's going to describe this. Pay attention. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together upon him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the, wit- and, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of the young man named Saul. Okay, I'm sorry. The text is actually right there in verse 56. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man. Okay? The Son of Man. Hold on to that. This is the Son of Man that just got taken up out of their sight riding upon the clouds of heaven, Stephen looks up into heaven. He says, I see the throne of God. And at the right hand of the throne of God, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What is he talking about? Turn with me to the prophet Daniel. Turn with me to the prophet Daniel. You're going to say, where in the world is Daniel? Daniel is right after, if you go... Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you're going to find Daniel in there. Okay? Daniel's right after Ezekiel. I know I skipped a couple books there for you, but Daniel's right after Ezekiel. Daniel, just a little bit of context. When is Daniel writing? Come on, Institute of Catholic Culture friends. Come on, tell me. Yeah, during the Babylonian exile, the Jews have been taken away from Jerusalem, right? And, he's, and, he, and he receives a vision there in Babylon. And this is the, re, the vision he receives. We won't go through the entire vision. But the basics are this. That he sees that there are going... He has a number of vision and dream interpretations in his prophecy. But he says, look. He says, there are, there are four kingdoms. The four kingdoms which will rise up. Okay? Traditionally understood to be... I wrote them down for the Babylonian kingdom, the Persian kingdom, which of course rises up with Cyrus. We've, we've studied that before. Okay? Uh, the Greeks and ultimately the Romans. Okay? And if you're wondering about that, and, uh, you can listen to my brother's series on the book of Revelation. He goes through, the, he goes through Daniel 7 and his visions. Okay? But ultimately Daniel says another kingdom is going to arise. And notice how he describes that next kingdom which is going to arise. We'll start in chapter 7, verse 9. And I looked, sorry, as I looked, thrones were placed, and, and one that was the ancient of days. This is God. He sees God. And one that was the ancient of days took his seat. 
His raiment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came forth before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousands stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I'm going to come to verse 13. And I saw in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, notice Acts chapter 1, with the clouds of heaven there came, literally riding upon the clouds, there came one like the Son of Man. Luke is quoting, or I should say Stephen, is quoting Daniel 7. And Luke, when he describes the ascension, quotes Daniel 7. Why is this important? Because he's just told us that there are going to be four kingdoms, and each one of those kingdoms is going to be destroyed by the next kingdom, except for the fifth kingdom. What does he say about this fifth kingdom? Come down with me to verse 21. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints received the kingdom. Come with me to verse 27. Verse 27. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heavens shall be given to the people of the saints of the, whole, of the Most High. And their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom. And all domin d dominions shall serve and obey them. In other words, this kingdom which comes to the one who is enthroned at the right hand of the Ancient of Days, the quote, Son of Man, which Stephen sees when he sees Jesus enthroned, this kingdom will have no end. And the saints of that kingdom will reign forever and ever. Now, I'm completely off my notes, so let me come back to my notes for a second here and see where I am. It is this understanding, the connecting by the early Christians of Acts, of the Apostles, of Stephen's martyrdom, of Daniel, that they understand the ascension as the royal enthronement of Jesus Christ, a kingdom which will conquer all the other kingdoms of the world and will reign forever. From the earliest days of the church, as the Christians meditated upon this mystery of the ascension, when I say from the earliest days, we are talking about Luke, the evangelist. We're talking about St. Paul. They understood the ascension of Christ as his royal enthronement as king over the universe. If we're to understand the ascension of Christ, we have to understand that mystery. From the earliest days then, they began to look into the messianic enthronement psalms. The psalms that were used for the enthronement of the son of David and began to apply them to the ascension of Christ. The liturgy, the ancient liturgy, is filled with psalms talking about the ascension of Christ. And I'm going to focus on one or two psalms to give you a sense of this and a sense of what St. Paul and St. Luke are seeing in the ascension of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Psalm 68. Psalm 68. So you go left, go back in your Bible, okay? I noticed a little uncomfortable chuckle there among the crowd. <laughs> Psalm 68. This, when I was preparing this talk and I came across this, it about blew, blew my mind, okay? Chapter 68, we're going to read verses 1 through 4 and then we're going to skip a little bit. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee from before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, let the wicked perish before God. But let the righteous be joyful. Let them exult before God. Remember Daniel 7, right? When the, when the Son of Man is enthroned with the Ancient of Days, who is going to reign upon this earth? They're going to be the saints the holy ones of God. Let them exult before God and let them be jubilant with joy. 
Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides upon the clouds. Okay? Very interesting. Ah, that's a nice reference back maybe Acts of the Apostles and St. Stephen. He who rides upon the clouds. But let me go one step further. I want you to come with me to verse 18. Thou didst ascend, okay, the ascension. Thou didst ascend the high mount, leading captives in thy train, and receiving gifts among men. You say, well, that doesn't seem that, like such a big deal, Deacon Sabatino. Thou didst ascend the high mountain, leading captives in thy train, and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Now, am I making too much of this riding on the clouds of heaven that we see in verse 4 and connecting it here to verse 18? Is this text really to be understood by the early Christians as a revelation of Jesus Christ and his enthronement? Keep your hand there in your Bible and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Keep your hand in your Bible and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. And you're saying, where in the world is Ephesians, right? <laughs> Don't worry, you'll find it. Okay? Ephesians 4. Are you with me? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at from verse 4 and read on. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. Remember I quoted... Cardinal Ratzinger earlier about understanding that phrase all in all. What does it mean that God is all in all? We're going to look at that. Verse 7. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said. St. Paul is going to quote now Psalm 68. Okay? Verse 18. When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives... And he gave gifts to men. Now, I told you to hold on to Psalm 68. I hope you did. Because I want you to look back at verse 18 now. And I'm going to come back to Ephesians 4. Okay? Let's look at verse 18 very carefully. Psalm 68, verse 18. Thou didst ascend the high mount, leading captives in thy train, and receiving gifts among men. Who is receiving gifts in this text? God is receiving the gifts from men, right? Now I'm going to turn back to Ephesians 4 and read you again verse 8. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. St. Paul has taken Psalm 68 and rewritten it. He has taken Psalm 68, which refers to Yahweh, which refers to the God of the Old Testament, and he places Jesus Christ there. He also turns the psalm around. The Psalm 68 says that Yahweh receives the gifts of men, but St. Paul rewrites 68 and said it is Jesus Christ who, when he ascends, gives gifts to men. This is absolutely important to understanding the connection between the first wave offering of the barley, the ascension of Jesus Christ and his enthronement, and the feast of Pentecost, which is coming in a few days. Jesus is the one that St. Paul says fulfills Psalm 68. And what does, Saint, what does Psalm 68 tell us in verse 4? That he who rides upon the clouds of heaven, that this one who is ascending to the heavenly throne, the son of man which Stephen sees, 
who is enthroned at the right hand of God is none other than God himself in the flesh. This is St. Paul's point. This is how St. Paul can take a psalm and rewrite the verse so that you can understand that now there's a further revelation taking place about who this one is who is risen from the dead. For they know now, because they see it take place, that he is none other than God himself. I'm going to read you from Cardinal Jean Danielou that exact point. I stole it from him. I don't mind to say it. He says it better than I did. He says, One characteristic of the tradition of Psalm 68 by St. Paul deserves our attention, for it is important for our thesis. While the Hebrew text speaks of gifts received by Yahweh, in fact, the Greek text says the same thing. I went and checked it. The, the, the Hebrew text speaks of gifts received by Yahweh. Paul speaks of gifts given by Christ. Here we have a modification of the text, which is certainly intentional. What is said concerning Yahweh in the Old Testament is here applied to Christ, and this application is entirely legitimate. Both the intentional use of the imagery from Daniel and the text of the Psalms confirms for us confirms for us that for the early Christians, the ascension was to be understood as the royal enthronement of Jesus, who is the Christ. Why is this important? Why is this important? Because, well, I should say, to understand why it's important, we have to draw a bit of a broader context to see the ascension as the early Christians, the Jews who accepted Christ as their Savior, would have seen it. They certainly, as we know, as digging into the Psalms, and we could look at others quoted by St. Paul, see this as Christ's royal enthronement. And why was this so fundamentally important? Those of you that have done Bible studies here at the Institute of Catholic Culture will know that the Jews at the time of Christ faced a major problem. It was a major problem that is rooted in the Old Testament in the text of 2 Samuel chapter 7. And what is that problem, friends? You tell me. What does 2 Samuel 7 tell us? Talk out. Come on. Thank you. That, that God would make the son of David's throne remain forever. That the king which ruled in Jerusalem, that his throne would never be destroyed. But you know that in the 7th century, the Babylonians marched upon Jerusalem and burned it to the ground. We studied together the prophecy of Jeremiah, the lamentations of Jeremiah as he wept over the burning city. In that time from the exile to Babylon to the coming of Christ, there was a great desire and a questioning. What about the promise of God? When would God act and restore the kingdom that he promised would remain forever, that he promised to his servant David? When would God put a king on the throne? When would the Messiah come? And as the years grew on, the hope of the people turned as it should have from being able to be fulfilled by simply the return of an earthly king. They had seen that before. And their earthly kings had failed them. And they began to place their hope in God and God alone who could extract them from the situation they found themselves in, in slavery to the Babylonians, under the rule of the Persians, under the rule of the Greeks, under the thumb of the Romans. When would God fulfill his promise to his servant David? Turn with me to the prophecy of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 34.
we see in Ezekiel, and we'll just use him as our one example because we're going to run out of time if I have you flipping all over the prophets. But we'll see now coming and developing in the prophets this hope of the people of God voiced by the mouth of the prophets that someday God surely would act. And he, when he acted, he would solve this problem that the throne of David had fallen. They began to refocus their attention, not so much on the kingship of humanity, but on the kingship of God. And I want to show you two verses in chapter 34 of Ezekiel. Chapter 34. Verse 15. God says, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I will be the shepherd of my sheep. We can see something very similar in the prophe prophecy of Zechariah. Okay? This says that God himself would be enthroned on earth as king. Turn one, a few verses with me. We read that. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. Turn also to verse 23. And I will set up over them one shepherd. Now stop. Who's that shepherd going to be? Oh, no, come on. Don't go New Testament on me. He just told us. Who is it going to be? It's going to be God. God is going to shepherd his people as king. But look at verse 23. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God. We see in here the prophecy of Ezekiel, as we see also in Zechariah and the other prophets, this coming together of the fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7, that yes, God would act. And when he acted, the one that would be enthroned would be both the descendant of David and the Son of God. And yes, that person, as we know, will be Jesus Christ. This brings us back again, then, to the heart of the issue regarding the ascension, or we might say the enthronement of Jesus the Christ. The early Christians, as I said, loved to use the Psalms to understand the mystery of the ascension. And I would like you to turn back very quickly with me to Psalm 23 to see one of the texts which was most often associated with the ascension in the early liturgical texts because it brings out an aspect of the ascension which is fundamentally important to that icon which I have on the screen. Psalm 23. I'm sorry, Psalm 24, 24, verse 7. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. This... This text, the, the, the fathers and the, and the Jews saw this text as a, as a discussion taking place between the angels and the one who is called the Son of Man, who is now coming to the Ancient of Days. Lift up your gates and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory, the angels say? The Lord. Strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. St. Irin, well, yeah, I've got a couple of quotes from the church fathers. I will just give you one. St. Justin the martyr says, O princes, lift up your gates and be raised, O eternal doors, and the King of glory shall come in. When Christ rose from among the dead and ascended to heaven, the princes established by God in the heavens were commanded to open the gates of heaven so that he who is the king of glory might enter in and ascend to sit at the right hand of the Father until he has made his enemies his footstool. But when the princes of heaven saw him, 
without beauty and honor and glory, when they saw a human entering into the throne of God, they did not recognize him and they yelled out, Who is this King of glory? The Catechism of the Catholic Church says that Jesus' final apparition ends with the irreversible entry of his humanity into divine glory, symbolized by the cloud and by heaven, where he is seated from that time forward at God's right hand. And here we face a new stratum, a new level of our interpretation. The Word of God, the fulfillment of Daniel 7, the Son of Man, who is enthroned with the Ancient of Days, is a human being. He is both God and man. This brings us back full circle to the earlier theme that, that Cardinal Ratzinger introduced to us, to the foundational theme of creation and the purpose of the incarnation, the passion, the resurrection, the ascension, and the sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Christ came that he might do with our human nature what Adam had failed to do. Namely, to receive the gift of God's life and with it to receive dominion over creation by his image and likeness of God. That he might give life that he might give the life that he received from the Father to others. If Adam had been faithful, if Adam had trusted, all of creation would have been filled up through his hands, through the dominion which he exercised over creation. The entire created order would have been sanctified. The entire created order would have been offered to God. The entire created order would have become the first fruits of new life on earth. They would have become the Todah sacrifice. They would have become Eucharisted. The entire world would have been divinized. we then can know what to expect from Jesus who is, according to St. Luke and according to St. Paul, the newly enthroned King of Glory. It is interesting to note that among the Jews there were three enthronements that took place for a king. The first enthronement, or I should say three anointings. The first anointing took place privately with the prophet the second anointing was with his family or his tribe. And the third anointing for the king among the Jews was done before the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus doesn't have three anointings or three enthronements. He has four. Jesus was anointed as king at the baptism in the Jordan River as the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Jesus was enthroned as king within his family, within his tribe, on Mount Tabor at the Transfiguration. When we hear that, those messianic words coming forth from the mouth of God, Behold my beloved Son, in fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7. Jesus was enthroned before the twelve tribes as he willingly climbed upon the cross and was enthroned there as king. But Jesus was enthroned a fourth time at the Feast of the Ascension, not only over Israel, but over the entire created order that he might have dominion over not only a small part of creation, but that he might have dominion over the entire creation, that he might do what Adam and Eve had failed to do, namely to fill up creation with the life of God, to love creation, to divinize it, to share the life which he had received from the Father, and to offer it as Eucharist back to his heavenly Father. 
turn with me then to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at three texts and we will call our evening done. Chapter 2, St. Peter's great proclamation on that day of Pentecost when he refers back to the mysteries which they have seen over the last few days. Chapter 2, verse 30. Well, let's start with, third, with 29. 29. Brethren, I may say to you confidently that the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Notice what what Luke is writing and what St. Peter is saying. He's saying, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having ascended, having ascended to the throne of God, he received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. And what did he do? He has poured out this which you see and hear. And what is it that they see and hear on that day of Pentecost? What do they see in here? No, they don't see the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down in the upper room. It descended upon them in tongues of fire. What do they see and hear? They see the apostles. They see those friends of Jesus who had been gathered together. Now, no longer with fire descending upon them, but filled up with the life of God. They behold the result of the ascension and the dominion of Jesus who is the King. They see before them the loaves to be baked on that Pentecost day and to be offered as a Eucharistic sacrifice to God. They behold the loaf, which is the fulfillment of that first fruits offering. They see the church, the body of Christ. And why is it that Peter says, when Jesus ascended... This is what he did. Because when Jesus ascended, he was enthroned as king. And as king, he did what Adam had failed to do, which was to give the life he had received to the creation which God had placed him in. He had failed to act as a priest in the image and likeness of God, sanctifying creation and divinizing it, and remaking it in the image and likeness of the Creator. Turn to one final text with me, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I haven't heard too many groans about all this turning around. It's great. You guys are getting there. Ephesians chapter 4. One of my favorite texts in the entire Bible. We've already looked at one verse but I want you to now go to the next verse because once we see the ascension of Jesus Christ as his royal enthronement as king, we see the result of that kingship in the next verse. Let us begin with verse 6. And remember, remember those, that quotation I gave you from Cardinal Ratzinger. Remember this image of man offering himself and all that is around him to God in sacrifice, giving back to the one who made him in his image and likeness as the one who bestows life. One, sorry, verse 5. Ah, verse 4, why not? <laughs> there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. But grace was given to each according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts 
to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is he who also ascended far above the heavens. That, now stop. When you see that word in your Bible, so that, you know you have the answer to the question you're wondering about, which is why did Jesus Christ leave us? Why did he ascend into heaven? Why was it necessary that he be enthroned on high? So that, St. Paul says, so that he might fill all things. And his gifts were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipment of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Why did Jesus ascend into heaven? That he might there be enthroned as king, not over his family, not over the 12 tribes of Israel, but over the entire created order and having dominion over this created order. He might do the one thing that Adam had failed to do, and that is pour out his life upon those over whom he had been given charge. The ascension calls for, it demands, it drives at the feast of Pentecost, which we are about to celebrate in a few short days. For those that are taking notes, write down the Gospel of John, chapter 14, and read that text very carefully. Because Jesus, my friends, has not left us. He has not left us. He has poured himself into us that we might be made into what he is. He is the first fruits of Pentecost. He is the first Eucharistic offering which points to, which demands, which drives at the revelation of the body of Christ on earth. And I will leave you with this. The words that St. Paul finishes his connection with ascension so that in the church there might be prophets, teachers, evangelists, that each one of us would be incorporated into him, that when we go out into the world, they may no longer meet Joe and Frank and Deacon Sabatino, but they may see in our eyes and touch in our hands Jesus Christ himself. If we want our church to be strong, my friends, if we want the body of Christ to be living on this earth, then prepare yourselves for the Feast of Pentecost when that gift of the Holy Spirit will descend upon us once again. Do not fear what God will do for, for us and for you. He gives us His life and He has dominion over us. I was reading in a book recently that if you... That why... The, the author asks, why... Do so many Catholics not know what to do with their Christianity? And she answers the question, I think she is quite right. It is because they have never prayed and asked God to do with them what He wants to do with them. We are His hands and His feet. And if we want Jesus walking around on this earth, if we want Him present among us, pray for it. Ask God to send down the Holy Spirit upon you on the Feast of Pentecost because we know that He is enthroned at the right hand of the Almighty. And from there, He reigns unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen.